Okay, welcome back. And uh, good to see you. Uh, if you're new here, my name's Joel, and I'm one of the leaders here at Christ the King. Uh, we are going through a book of the Bible called Ephesians. Every week we have teaching from the Bible. Ephesians is uh, really near the end of the Bible. It's uh, about two-thirds through the New Testament, and we are in chapter 3. We're going to start chapter 3 with verses 1 to 6, so I will read from them in just a moment, then we'll pray, and then we will uh, see what it has to teach us today. Really good to see you uh, today, and really good to speak to you at Shoreham and the race course as well. Really a privilege to speak to so many people at one point across the city. Really glad to have you with us. Okay, verse 1. For this reason, I... Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who comes to open our eyes so that we can see Jesus more clearly. We pray that as we get into these words from the Bible today, you would speak to us powerfully through them, by the Holy Spirit, taking the words and burning them into our hearts and bringing real transformation. Lord, we want to, we want to be made new, to be transformed by our encounter with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, when you read this book of Ephesians, you, you notice that you really are dealing with a, a clear and strong personality. The person that wrote this is a, is a, a real human being. This, this isn't a textbook. Uh, the Bible is not a textbook in any sense. It really is a, a story. It's a, a, a lot of stories bound together, but it tells one huge grand story. And the book of Ephesians is, is a letter. It's filled with important teaching. It's filled with lots and lots of what we would call doctrine, theology, but it's theology for a purpose. It's, it's written into a, a real situation with real people, and it's written by a real person. Uh, you get some of the, the vividness or, or the dra- drama of the situation if you look even at those first two verses and notice the situation there. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And then he says in verse 2, Oh, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. What was going on there? I mean, you can read past these things so quick you don't notice the the dynamic of of, of the words. What Paul's actually doing here is he's kind of interrupting himself. He started by telling these people that he's in prison, and now he's thinking, oh, Ah, I I better just make sure they understand why I'm in prison and what's going on. I think he's genuinely concerned for the the people he's writing to, that they won't be discouraged or shaken in their faith by the fact that their leader, their spiritual father, is in jail. That's a big thing for them to come to terms with. And he's writing now, thinking, right, I must make sure I explain this situation carefully. So he kind of pauses and throws in a few verses as a a kind of parenthesis. What I mean by parenthesis, it's like it's in brackets, or at least with a big hyphen either side. It's like he's saying, okay, just hold up, let me just explain myself here. And what he has to explain is actually something quite dramatic, it's quite shocking. In fact, if you think about it, it's a fairly grand claim that uh, ordinarily you would find a little bit suspicious. Because what he's basically saying is, I'm in prison because of some things that God has told me. Some things that God has personally told me. And if you read on, it's, it's, if you get it the wrong tone of voice in this, he sounds, he sounds like a megalomaniac. He sounds almost insane. He sounds like he's one of those guys that you would give a wide berth to in the pub, okay? or, or even lock up. Because one of those people who thinks 
he, he thinks he's a, I don't know, thinks he's a horse, thinks he's Napoleon, whatever. He's, he's, he's just lost it. He's deluded. Read it. He says this, uh, verse 3. This, this mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, notice my tone of voice, though, right? I'm, I'm making it sound extreme to make the point. That's definitely not the tone of voice that we would expect from this guy. But you see, in the wrong mouth, these words sound ridiculous. He's saying, I know things that no one else knows because God has told just me. What? Well, people like that, that's just weird. I mean, let's be honest. Apart from everything else, we struggle with the whole idea of people knowing things full stop. People knowing information, knowing anything, knowing anything final. We, we, we're not keen on that. We, we're scared of people who think they know truth. So we like to talk more about tolerance and being very open-ended about what can be known. And we also live in a culture which is very influenced by the idea that you, you have to provide a certain kind of evidence, certain kind of weighty let's say, scientific argument for any truth claim. Otherwise, it can't be true. If you can't back something up, you can't know it. If it's not backed up with weighty evidence, scientific, observable evidence, well, that's not going to be real knowledge. But that's that's the, the idea that prevails in our culture. We often, even if we don't put it in those terms, we, we kind of drink from that cup, if you know what I mean. We, we're all influenced by that kind of culture where... To really believe stuff requires huge amounts of weighty scientific evidence. Now, listen, that's not wrong. I'm not going to stand up and say, oh, you know, that's, God is anti-science. We're, we're the anti-science church. Join us and kiss your brains goodbye. That's what we like in this church. No, no, no. The, the, the reality is that the Bible and the, the, the Christian view of the world gives a huge, stable foundation for taking science and reason and logic and mathematics very seriously because the Christian view of the world says that the world was actually formed by a mind, by an, an incredibly precise mind. And, and we've been made to know things as, as he's made them. We, we, we have these gifts of minds, minds that can deduce and work things out rationally. These are gifts from God. So we have a, a basis, in fact, a better basis for doing science than those who say there, there's no God, it's all just an accident. Well, why is my mind to be trusted then if my mind is just an accident? No, no, no. no. The, the, the Bible and Christianity give a robust, strong, healthy basis for using the mind to understand the world. But bear in mind that there are other ways of knowing things than just through those processes of Scientific observation, for example. There are so many ways we know things. We often believe things on the basis of people's testimony. You might say, oh no, we should only believe things that we have strong evidence for. If you only do that, you'll die. As a baby, you can't know for sure that you know, I don't know, your mum's breast milk isn't poisoned. You're not going to do scientific experiments to prove this. You don't even know what that means. You just believe it. You just do, you choose to. There's a, there's a sense in which we're always, all of us, having to take a lot of things on testimony. And then there's other kinds of knowledge that are so innate that we don't really know how we got there. We just know it. How do you know that rape is wrong? You can't prove that scientifically. There's no, there's no laboratory where this has been tested. There's no statistical analysis. We can't do it that way. But we do know it's wrong. I think we just know there might be some who'd say, well, let's, let's, let's say, oh, it's wrong in some contexts and maybe it's not always wrong. No, don't be ridiculous. You just know some things are wrong, some things are right. Some things are evil, some things are good. How do you know that? Is that scientific? No. And let me ask you one more question. This idea that you can only know something if it's proven scientifically, how do you know that? Do you know that scientifically? <laughs> can you prove that scientifically? No, you can't. It's utterly unprovable to say that you can only know things that are provable. It's ridiculous. It falls down on its own sword. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense to itself. 
No, no, no. We have to accept that, yeah, God's given us our minds and given us reason and rational processes. God's given these things, but there are also other ways of knowing. And, and this man in this letter is talking about why, things that he's been made to know directly from the God who made everything. Now, somebody claiming that doesn't have to be believed. But we shouldn't assume that they're making it up either. Do you see what I'm saying? We shouldn't just assume, oh, well, that's impossible. That, that could never happen. Why could that never happen? If there is a God, if God's made us to know him, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to expect, that God would show himself and reveal himself to people. If he's kind and merciful and he wants to show himself, he'll do that. And that's what Paul's claiming has happened. Now, why am I going on about this? I, I just want you to understand that this guy is to be taken seriously in spite of a lot of genuine concerns we might have. I mean, there are people through history who've said, God has told me this. And they started off all kinds of strange, flaky cults, religions that are destructive. And, and they disagree even with each other. God's told me this. Well, actually, God told me the opposite. <laughs> we have a problem. So, so we can't just say, oh, well, if God told you, flip, oh, flip, oh, all right then. God told you that you should have my, my car and the keys, then fair enough. Then you are. God told me that you're, you're welcome to my bank account. And, oh, fine, that's what, yeah, you have it. Now, of course, you, you, you use your critical faculties. You're allowed to do that. You're supposed to do that. It's irresponsible not to. So what questions should we ask? We should say, well, what about this man, Paul? What do we know about him? Was he, was he a nutter? Was he mental? Was he just somebody that, I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. He's just crazy. Well, what, what can I say? Let me, let me give you a few quick possible answers to that. Let me give you just four. I'll rush through them. The first of them, his story, his story is remarkable. His story lends credibility to his testimony. Paul was not always called Paul. He used to be called Saul. That was his Jewish name. He was a persecutor of the church. He hated Christians. He locked them up. In fact, he tried to force them to blaspheme, which suggests that he tried to torture them. When one of them was murdered, Paul stood by looking after everyone's jackets while they threw rocks at this man to kill him. Paul was a violent, hateful man, despiser of Jesus, until the day he meets Jesus. And then doesn't just become a Christian, but becomes the greatest proponent of Christianity the world's ever known. Suffering, traveling, preaching, writing, starting churches, gave his life, his whole life, spent his life, ultimately got killed because of his commitment to the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's fascinating in itself. And it causes a lot of people a real headache. People who say, well, New Testament shouldn't be taken seriously. Explain Paul. His story is so hard to explain if this Jesus isn't really risen from the dead. His story is fascinating. His story helps us to understand that something very real happened to him. We should at least consider taking him seriously. Let me also say, secondly, his story and his teaching is corroborated by the, the teaching of the other apostles, as they were called. Jesus had 12 close disciples who he called apostles. Paul was not one of them. He became a Christian way after them, way after. But when he became a Christian, Paul went to the other apostles to check out that what he was teaching fit with what they were teaching. He wouldn't want to go ahead just teaching and teaching and teaching and finding out when he died that he got it all wrong and that Jesus taught something very different than what he said had been revealed to him. Jesus revealed loads of stuff to me. Well, Paul, it doesn't really fit in with what we teach. Oh, well, that's your problem. No, 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 he wasn't like that. He didn't think, well, I've had special revelation. You're just disciples who hung out with Jesus for three years. No, no, he, he carefully checked. If you go back to the book just before Ephesians in the Bible, you get to Galatians, and it says in chapter 2, verse 2, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure, listen, to make sure, oh, this should come up on the screen, I was not running or had not run in vain. He's saying, I, I, I really wanted to not waste my time. I wanted to check it out. And when he checked it out, it was good. That's very important to know. It means that Paul's preaching, Paul's message, Paul's revelation was not just him going flaky on everybody and having his own ideas that were actually rejected 
by the existing establishment of apostles. That means we can take it even more seriously. And also we can learn a very important lesson. Let me tell you, whoever you are, if you're a Christian or if you're just checking out Christianity, the Bible is, is the, the document that we take seriously as the final word on what God says. The reason we do that is at least partly because Jesus himself did that. Jesus said that the, the scriptures cannot be broken. He saw the scriptures as the final authority. And he told his apostles, you will be the ones who will write scriptures. You'll be the ones the Holy Spirit will lead into the truth. So Jesus has told us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to take the book very seriously. Take it as the highest authority on all the issues. That means that whenever someone comes along saying, well, God has told me this. God has told me this. Well, I think God has told me to do this. The first question we should ask them and ourselves is, how does what they're claiming God has told them fit with what God has definitely told us here? Okay, that's really important. And sometimes you can almost feel a little bit guilty for asking that. Sometimes you feel the pressure. If someone comes along, some people are, they can be bullish. They can be very impressive. Oh, the Lord has told me. And put on a weird voice and a weird suit and do the whole thing. You know, oh, the Lord's spoken to me. And, and you, you can be so intimidated. You can start, your conscience can get a beating. You can start doing and saying and acting in ways that you think, you know what, I'm not even sure if this is right. You are completely at liberty to say to such a person, uh, excuse me, can I just check this with the Bible? And if they say something that God has told them and it doesn't fit with what the Bible teaches, then you can say, I don't think God told you that. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. You can do that with clear conscience. You don't have to listen to anyone. You do have to listen to God. So, so we're right to check people out with the Bible. That's a good approach. That's what Paul even did, even with his own revelation. <laughs> he met Jesus. He just shockingly met Jesus. He still checked it out with the apostles. How humble. Isn't that interesting? That's the way we should be about all kinds of revelation that we get. Check things. Does this fit with what God has said? Does this fit with existing... Revelation that has already come. Third thing, quickly. Paul himself was a strong and together personality. Paul doesn't show signs of being uh, just mentally and emotionally unstable. He was an emotionally strong man, but he was emotionally strong in a way that was very together, very integrated. People trusted him. People wanted to trust him. He won the affections and hearts of many people. He lived a, a tremendously stable and authentic life by anyone's judgment. Even if you hate Christianity, you have to admire the Apostle Paul for the kind of remarkable person he was. In other words, he, he wasn't mentally and emotionally disintegrated. The people who hear voices in their heads and claim that God is speaking to them and start making things up, to be honest, really that tends to go with a, with a kind of an emotional and mental disintegration. They don't have the strength of personality that Paul was obviously gripped by. He, he, he was on a clear mission. He led a clear life. He was very determined. He was very together. He wrote some of the most important intellectual pieces of writing from the ancient world. He also wrote some of the most mature and tender bits of moral teaching the world's ever known. 1 Corinthians 13 that we all read at weddings. Description of love. Who wrote that? The Apostle Paul. This guy that's hearing voices in a prison. Him. He's the guy that wrote this beautiful, long chapter about the richness of love. So we're not talking about an unstable man. We're talking, if anything, about the opposite. We're talking about one of the strongest, most wonderful men. I would have loved to have met him. Not as much as I want to meet Jesus, but a fascinating man. Fourth and final thing, he suffered. He really does suffer. I mean, this chapter is written in prison, all right? He's concerned about them, though, while he's in prison. Isn't that interesting? And right up to verse 13. If you've got it, uh, it says in verse 13, I, I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm suffering. All right, I'm in prison. But guys, don't lose heart. It's for your glory that I'm here. And I'm just pleased. You read this letter, six chapters of excitement, six chapters of glorious eternal theology, Six chapters of wisdom and teaching and how to run your life, how to run your family, how to run your marriage, how to run the church. If you got a letter from me, if, if I got thrown in prison, you know, if you got a letter from Joel Virgo to the church in Brighton, from Lewis Prison, 
That could happen. Who knows? One day. <laughs> Certain people get their way. It's definitely will happen. This, this letter I wrote you, I guarantee it would not be like the letter to the Ephesians. It could be six chapters. It could be that. That could be the only thing it's got in common. The rest of it would be, I am I'm really very fed up. And it would be just me describing the different ways in which I'm fed up. And the different things that I disapprove of about my fellow prisoners and the, the things I hate about this life and hate about you and, you know, don't really want you to come and visit me because I'm in a mood. And You can send me some things if you like. Send me, send me, send me some DVDs and a few books. But leave me alone. And just, I mean, that's honest. I'm just being honest. And you would say that you would do the same. Okay, that's what you Yes, you would. This guy is writing this letter. He's just, he doesn't really talk about himself that much, have you noticed? And when he does, he's kind of just a little bit, almost a bit ashamed of himself. He's really fascinated with Jesus. He's fascinated with them. That tells me two things. First of all, it tells me that he's not a con man. Okay? Because one thing we could be suspicious, if someone comes along saying, God has given me a revelation, one reason they might say that is to get some cash out of us. It's not unheard of. It has happened in history. The Lord has spoken to me. It happens now. You turn on certain TV channels. That's what happens. Okay, you send in your check and the Lord will bless you. Oh, certainly, yeah, please. And poor people write off loads of money for some rich guy in a, with a helicopter in a swimming pool who God is speaking to. Well, that's not Paul. He's not a con man. This guy's in prison. But it also tells me that he's... He's authentic. He's in prison, but he's joyful. This message that he's, this revelation he's got, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is, it must be good. It ought to make you think. You might think, well, Christianity, I don't know if I can believe it. Well, start by thinking about this. Even if it isn't true, it makes people in prison happy. It's a good place to start, I suggest. You'll find out as well that it's true. <laughs> But that is astonishing. So let me just finish. I've only got a little bit of time left now by talking about particularly the thing that has been revealed to Paul that he's going on about in this part of the, the Bible. Okay? So here I'm just going from verse, I'll go from verse 6 here. He says, The mystery is that the Gentiles, and by Gentiles we mean everyone that's not Jewish, okay? If, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. The Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, why is that so exciting? And why is it landing him in prison? Why is that so controversial? If I went out into the streets, even if I went to the police, you know, knocked on the door at the police station, okay, I'll give myself up. I believe that this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a fair cop. Tie me up. You know, put the cuffs on. Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of the problem. You might as well put me in for the night. I've really blown it. I believe in this Ephesians 3 verse 6. Sorry. Why is that so? Why are you in prison for it? Well, this is the extraordinary thing. And you have to understand the context. The Bible tells the story of God reaching out to the whole world to win it back. Like a like a heartbroken husband wanting to win back a bride. But he, he does it by starting with one unique ethnic group, the Jews. So that's why actually most of the Bible, the, old, the whole Old Testament, which is much bigger than the New, is about God's relationship to Israel. Now, the other nations get mentioned now and then, but not that much really. It's really about God's heart for one ethnic people. Having said that, his relationship with this, this ethnic people, the Jews, who he loved and looked after from the very beginning, the, the father, Abraham, who had many sons, as you might know from a kid's song. He has many, many children, many grandchildren. It's, it goes on and on, generation after generation after generation. From that very beginning, even at the very beginning, when God chose Abraham, he said to Abraham and his offspring, to the whole nation of Israel, I'm blessing you in order... To bless the whole world. Yeah, I have chosen you. I, I didn't choose the, the Greeks or the, the Egyptians or the Hittites or the Midianites or whatever. I didn't choose them. I chose the Jews. I chose Israel. But listen, I chose Israel with all these others in mind. 
I chose you because I love the world. And you are my special people who will represent me to the lost, broken, distant world that I'm longing for, I have great compassion for. I'm starting with you to reach them. That was always God's plan. He said it to Abraham in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 12, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Such an extraordinary thing to say to one man. And the promise builds from then on, Genesis right through to the end of the Old Testament. In some books of the Old Testament, like Isaiah, big book, big long book, which is a long prophecy by one man, He talks a lot about this. He talks a lot about God's desire to reach out to all the nations and that he's going to one day visit his people, Israel, in such a glorious and epic way that it causes light to shine and spread to all the nations of the world. That was always God's plan, and it's explicitly taught in many parts of the Old Testament. It's even in some of the the hymns that the... The, the ancient people of God, the Jews, used to sing back to God. If you go to the book of Psalms, it's like the, uh, the Israelites' hymn book. There's, there's lovely verses where they just kind of hint at this deep conviction. I'm just thinking of, for example, uh, Psalm 86, verse 9. It says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. In the heart of the people, there was this universal global hope. Yeah, we we love being the people of God, but we know all the nations will come in one day. All the nations! They loved it. And that's just one verse. I could quote literally hundreds of verses that point to the same idea. God wants to reach out to the whole world. Now, that much wasn't controversial. So, So Paul would have grown up as a young Jew thinking, yeah, we're the people of God, they're not the people of God, the Gentiles, but one day they can become the people of God, provided they become Jews. That was it. That was what you had to do. You had to become Jewish. If you wanted to come in, you had to become just like us. And if you want to know what just like us means, there are five big fat books of the Old Testament that tell you, and they tell you in intricate detail. They tell you about food laws, things you're not allowed to eat, things that you are allowed to eat. Tell you about special days, days when you shouldn't do certain things, what you should do on the Sabbath, what you shouldn't do on the Sabbath. They tell you about the way that we worship, the special way that we worship and sacrificial system. Animals need to be cut and bled and, and, and put down on the altar and We need to go to a a special place where God dwells called the tabernacle. And a bit later it became this big stone temple. They also tell you about the special rites that need to be performed on all males on the eighth day. They should all be circumcised. So if you want to be Jewish, you've got to go through all these rituals. Food laws, Sabbath, temple, circumcision. And without fail. That's what it means to be one of the people of God. You've got to fit in tightly, tightly. You're going to look different than you used to look. You you want to be part of God's people? You've got to come right out in every sense from your culture and adopt our culture, our way, our style, everything about us. That was the way to do it. And if that was going to happen, I think probably most of the Jews, including Paul before he became a Christian, would have been fairly happy with Christianity. In many ways, they would have thought, oh, I suppose... They're reaching out to people and bringing them into God's family. They've got this weird Jesus teaching as well, but never mind. The thing that people couldn't stomach was when Gentiles started coming in as Gentiles, not as Jews. They didn't turn into Jews. They, they, they stayed Gentiles, and yet they were given a place at the table with Jews. And they were talking as if they were the people of God. You're saying, yeah, yeah well, the promises belong to us now. We are also children of Abraham. What? We, we are the temple. Do you know what? That stone building in Jerusalem, that's not so important anymore because we are the temple. How dare you? And the Sabbath, yeah, it was an important thing, the Sabbath, the day of rest. Jesus has brought us into a greater rest even than the Sabbath. What? You're saying you're not going to keep the Sabbath carefully? And the laws, all the Old Testament laws, the ritualistic laws, all the carefully written laws of the Old Testament, yeah, they're still good, they're still important. Jesus said that they will not be cast away. These are good laws, they're important laws, but you know what? They're obsolete. 
Their time has come. Their time has come and gone. We now know God not through the law, but through the life of the Holy Spirit. He's written his laws inside us. We still read these laws, but really to help us understand the ways of God. We don't need to read them to know what to do because the Holy Spirit's written the laws inside us, so we obey God from the heart. Man, that sounds wonderful, but to the Jewish people of the time, it was disgusting. That's not too strong a word. It was violently disgusting. It would make them throw up. That's not, I'm not going over the top. I mean, it made them put Paul in prison for a start. Because what you're saying is you're stamping on everything we are. This is who we are. We are the oppressed people of God. And those Gentiles, they're dogs. That was the word they had for Gentiles, the dogs. And then God says, I want you to welcome the dogs to your table. I want you to celebrate with bread and wine with the dogs. I want you to host them in your homes. I want you to celebrate life. I want you to pray with them and laugh with them and cry with them. I want you to do life and enjoy the Spirit. And worship Jesus with the dogs. Oh, come on. This is, this is against our whole history. Think of Abraham. Think of Isaac. Think of Jacob. Think of Moses. Think of David. Think of what these men fought and bled for. You're going to throw that away on some crazy Jesus cult. It was highly offensive. And yet Paul says, this is a mystery he says in verse 5, not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is new. You can get hints of it in the Old Testament, but without the New Testament, the Old Testament doesn't tell the whole story. You need the whole story, and you need Jesus. You need this lens through which you can see what God's been doing through the whole of history. If Jesus gets taken out of the Bible, the whole Bible makes little or no sense. It points in the wrong direction almost. Jesus actually said this to some people in John chapter 5. You, you may remember some words he used when he was talking to some of his critics who, who came along and, and really hated what he was saying. These were Bible teachers who loved the Bible. They were Jewish people. They, they cared about their traditions. And they came along and Jesus has to say to them these words that shock them. He says, he says, uh, let me get to the right words here. He says in verse 39 of John 5, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Imagine if I stood up here one day at church and said, uh, CCK, uh, New England, Shoreham, Racecourse, all of you people, different services. Just wanting to know, the Bible... The Bible, you've all got a Bible, yep, we've got a Bible, some of you've got two. All of you, the Bible you've got, it's all about me. Me. And if, you, if you've been reading your Bible without thinking about me, you're going to get all kinds of mistakes. You're going to get it all wrong. It needs to be understood. The Bible is all about me, otherwise it doesn't make sense. That's what Jesus is saying. It's crazy, but it's true. Jesus is claiming to be God's final revelation. That's why it says in John chapter 1, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. There's something more. When we understand Jesus, it helps us to understand the whole story. And that helps us with the way we read the Old Testament. If you're a new Christian, or even if you've been a Christian for years and you've struggled to understand the Bible, let me give you a clue. The New Testament is the key to understanding the Old Testament. All of the things, the stories the Old Testament tells are preparation pointing to Jesus. And until we get Jesus in there, solid, clear, boom, big foundation, cornerstone, then, then we, we're actually going to misinterpret the Bible. Start with Jesus and you start to see, oh, so when the prophets talk about this suffering servant, they're talking about Jesus. When the Old Testament talks about the priests and the sacrifices, it's about Jesus. When they talk about the temple, it's about Jesus. When they talk even about Israel, this people, this ethnic, unique, distinct people, cut off by ethnicity and traditions and customs and rituals, it was preparation for a global people who would be identified not by their ethnicity and their cultural badges, but by Jesus. So these days, to come to know God, you don't have to become Jewish. You don't really have to become anything. 
You don't have to go through some system of cultural change. You don't have to say, well, all right, I have to do this and this and this now. Certainly your life will change big time. It will change a lot more than Sabbaths and circumcision and food laws and and temples would do to you. You might think, well, nothing could be worse. (laughs) I tell you, getting to know Jesus changes you much more than that. But it changes you on the inside, not through just rituals and customs. Jesus has made the rituals and customs irrelevant. They're over. The rituals and the customs were to keep the people separate and kind of clean and pure. Now, they didn't really work. They weren't likely to work. God knew they wouldn't work. Because people aren't changed by rules that they can't keep. People aren't changed by circumcision and food laws. They're not really changed in their heart. So even the best things, even the priests, all the stuff that was done, the animals that were slaughtered, the people waiting to see the priests come out of the sanctuary and saying, oh, God's forgiven us, God's had mercy this year on us, and we might have good grain offerings, we might have good, we might have good family and good prosperity because oh, God's forgiven us. This, that, that level of knowing God, that was about as close as they got. That We've got to be the pure people of God, constantly hoping that they were pure enough. Is my, is my tunic pure enough to be a priest? Is my, am, am I living a pure enough life? Constantly frightened that they're not pure. And Jesus comes, the, one, the only one in history who is truly pure. The priest above all priests. He comes and he doesn't just give a sacrifice of animals. He gives a sacrifice of his own body. His own blood is shed. Jesus deals ultimately with the need for purity. Jesus, the pure one, became impure. So that not just Jews who keep rules carefully, but Gentiles, Gentile dogs, all the nations of the world, gets to be called pure in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that qualifies, who cleanses, who purifies people to get to know God. Jesus has exhausted the need for any kind of legal sacrificial system. He's replaced it. There's a new people of God now. God still loves the Jews. And Romans chapter 11 teaches that God's going to do something amazing with the, 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 the Jewish people before history is over and win many of them back to him. But friends, all people come into relationship with God now on the same basis. We all do. You can't come in saying, well, I'm in because my father was, is Abraham. You can't come in and say, well, I'm in because I'm from a religious family. You can't come into Jesus' world, and say, into the church or into the kingdom of God and say, well, I'm in because I keep the rules. No, 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 no. That is never going to work. You come in because of Jesus. And when you've met this Jesus, when he's revealed this powerful, glorious message of his love and his life to you, well, it does change you. You, you. You'll find that you're kind of similar to Paul in some ways. I mean, I joke that I would write a grumpy letter from prison. I hope that it might not be as grumpy as it would have been a few years before I met Jesus. He does start changing you. He does start winning your heart and shaping you and making you new. Your life takes on qualities of his life, just like Paul here. See, Paul's suffering in prison, pouring out his life for the sake of people that didn't know God, prepared to suffer for their sake. He's getting in trouble Because he loves those people that are far away, far away from God. He's pouring out his life on mission for them. That reminds me so clearly of Jesus himself. When you get this revelation, when you get to see the glory of who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, it does change you on the inside. It makes you want to love him, serve him, and suffer for him, even joyfully. You may be thinking, well, if I become a Christian, will that be painful? Will that cost me? Will that be difficult? Will it change my life? Yes, all of the above. You bet. It will cost you. It will be painful. It will change your life. But you read this book. You look at the way Paul's life is filled with meaning, joy, excitement. My, I pray for you that you will get some of the glorious knowledge of the purposes of God in your heart. That's what you need. You need. That's why Paul prays in chapter 1. Remember a few weeks ago, if you were here, where he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be open, that you might see the riches of his, his inheritance in the saints. What's he saying? He said, I want you to be as excited about Jesus and his glorious global people as I am. It's not enough for me that I'm excited in prison. I want you to be just as excited as I am. I'm praying for you that you'll get this in your gut. 
And some of it you'll get through people like me trying to yell at you until you get it and reading your Bible and understanding it that way. But actually there's something the Holy Spirit has to do. You need the Spirit to grip you with the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and grip you with the glorious church that he's building. I remember a few years ago when a dear friend of ours, John Hosier, who used to be a preacher in this church, he now lives in Bournemouth, he was preaching from this book of Ephesians. He just finished preaching. It was a great message. I remember just to close his Bible, and then the musicians came up and we sang. And I just stood there. And suddenly I couldn't sing anymore. I was so overwhelmed with emotion. I couldn't stop. I mean, I, was, I couldn't stop crying. And I, mean, I, just, I mean, I get emotional sometimes, but I, I mean, I was, couldn't stop. It was extraordinary. And then, I mean, I, this, I'm not trying to freak you out, but I felt genuinely that God just came and came and rested on me. Like I felt, I mean, this is literally, I mean, trust me, this doesn't happen every day. <laughs> like some kind of literally a current of power going through my body. I felt like things leaning on my hands. I was like, what is going on? What is going on? I realized what was going on. I remembered it ever since. It went on for ages. I, I got home very late that day. And I felt like what was happening was very obvious. John, John had preached this very clear message that I understood in my mind. And the Holy Spirit came and said, I want you to feel this. I want you to feel the glory of, my, of Jesus. I want you to feel the glory of the hope of the church. I want you to be excited in, in your heart about it. If you, say, if you say, you're preaching weird mysteries. I don't understand Jews, Gentiles. Who cares? It's just me and Jesus. I, just, oh, oh, I came to church just to feel happy this week. All this theology is doing my head in. Come on, get to the nice bit. I'll have some bread and we'll sing a song. I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to you. Because you need to see this, this is the guts of it. If you don't have a bigger picture of the glorious Son of God and His purpose to unite all things under His Lordship and to bring about a people made from every different language and tribe and culture to glorify Him for eternity, you're missing out. Your religious Christian life is feeble. It's pathetic. Just you and Jesus. Fine. Okay, fine. But Paul would pray for you that you'd be gripped by the greater vision and give your life to it. Give your life to it.